All right, so we're, we're the, here this afternoon and uh, talking about the Eucharist. So on Tuesday, we built a, a big background on the Old Testament. And so now we can comfortably move ahead, and we're going to talk about what we call late Second Temple Judaism. Uh, we're going to look at the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls and so on, the light that they shed, because the Jews were reading those texts that we talked about on Tuesday. They weren't ignorant of those texts. They were meditating on that, on those prophecies and the typology of the meal with God uh, in the end time. And some of them were already um, celebrating sacred meals as an anticipation, a kind of a mystical anticipation of the eschatological banquet that the Messiah would bring, which indeed he did bring. He did show up and he brought the meal. And uh, we're going to talk about that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this afternoon for the uh, beauty of your word and for the beauty of the most blessed sacrament, uh, which you've given us to uh, remain with us in your, in your real presence until the end of time, until you come back before our eyes for the final judgment. Yeah, Lord, in this talk, we pray that you uh, enlighten our minds and inflame our hearts uh, with love for you in the sacrament, that our passion uh, may overflow and lead uh, many to discover you as well. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So when um, Deacon Ralph was uh, speaking this morning, uh, just what a beautiful talk, and I, I kept thinking about how he went back and forth between head and heart, you know, between what we know and what we love. And uh, we know we need both. We need both the head and the heart. And uh, sometimes we do better at one and sometimes we do better at the other, but God has to transform both. Um, so to enlighten the mind and to inflame inflame the heart. And, and uh, Deacon talked about that time when he was asked to, um, to assist at Mass and how reticent he was to hold up the Eucharist and say the body of Christ because he wasn't sure if he fully believed that. And so he studied and he read and got into the scriptures and theologians and so on. And so it was kind of the head, but it came back to the heart and making that act of faith, which is, which is made in the heart. And so we're going we're gonna to do a lot ahead for the next hour, but we're also going to come back to heart. And one of the things that grieves, grieves my heart is when I hear about um, Catholics uh, who have left the church and go to some Protestant megachurch and say, well, you know, I wasn't getting fed in the Catholic church, or I found Jesus in this other church, etc., and that pains me to my heart. And in one sense, I know what they mean, and in another sense, I feel tremendous frustration because what they were looking for was literally right in front of them. Um, so, you know, I'm wearing a shirt that I wore at my high school graduation. I have uh, a lot of Catholic friends, or I had a lot of Catholic friends in my graduating class. Um, all but one uh, have left the church, okay? And... Um, you know, I've, I've talked with them over email about the different reasons. Some aren't practicing anything. Some are going to Protestant churches. Uh, one friend of mine uh, ironically became a Calvinist. I became a Catholic. She became a Calvinist. <laughs> Just passing like chips in the night, you know. Um, and, I, and, and I asked her, you know, why did you become a Calvinist? Well, um, you know, I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus while I was in the Catholic church. And I wrote to her and I asked her, well, you say you didn't have a personal relationship, but what did you think was actually going on when you came forward and received communion? You know, no answer. Okay, that was the end of that conversation. <laughs> if I had a quarter for every conversation that, that has ended. <laughs> I don't know what it is about me. Do I smell? I don't know. What is it about me? So many people don't want to talk to me. All right. Whatever. Um, so... But let me, again, talk about my own experience. So I grew up very devout uh, Christian household. My father was a U.S. Navy chaplain. That's why I spent half my life in Hawaii. Got, kept getting sent back to Navy and Marine Corps units uh, on Oahu. But at one time, 
we were stationed at uh, the, the dual sub bases up in uh, New London, Groton, Connecticut. Anybody from that area? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, a couple of you. All right, right. New York, you know, New England area, right on the coast of uh, Connecticut there, about, uh, you know, just a few minutes from uh, the border with uh, Rhode Island. You've got uh, New London, Groton, and these sub bases, and you also got the Coast Guard Academy there. And my dad was the chaplain for the Coast Guard Academy, and he was also overseeing comm subgroups 2 and 10, which are on either side of the Thames River there. And um, over in Groton, we went to a, uh, a conservative Baptist church um, for our personal worship. Uh, my dad was, you know, the chaplain for the base, but, you know, it's, it's hard to always be worshiping in that environment where, you know, you're in the military system and just kind of to re relieve stress and have some quiet time with the Lord, went to a civilian church off base and we worshiped with these Baptists. And I I was about 12 at the time, and I got myself uh, a job as a volunteer junior librarian in the church library. And that meant uh, I could open up the library after the Sunday evening service and allow the churchgoers to browse for a half hour, 45 minutes after the Sunday evening service and chit chat with each other and maybe pick up a book uh, to read. And that gave me access to the whole church library. And I love that because I was a bookish little boy as you might imagine, and um, I read voraciously in the collection that they had there, and this is one of the books that they had, The Gospel Blimp and Other Stories by Joseph Bailey. Now, Joseph Bailey is a popular evangelical Protestant writer, kind of aging now, but, you know, his heyday was back in the 80s, and he would write these uh, humorous uh, parables about uh, contemporary uh, church life, really Protestant church life in the U.S. And uh, so I read this, this little book, you know, of, you know, poking fun at the foibles of American Christians and, um, you know, kind of gently prodding us toward uh, greater fidelity to the Word of God. But the, I, I, most of the stories I don't remember too well, but I'll never forget the last one in this collection. The last chapter was a little story called How Shall We Remember John? Okay. And this, this little story, only about three pages long, had a profound impact on my understanding of the Christian faith, uh, and not so much for the good either. Okay, but let me explain. So this is how the story goes. There once was this family that had a beloved older son, oldest son named John, and everybody loves John. But one day in the wintertime, John falls through the ice on the family pond and goes on to be with the Lord. And so after the funeral, uh, the families gather together, siblings, uh, parents, and they're talking to each other, trying to, you know, uh, work through their grief. And one of them pipes up and says, well, how shall we remember John? How can we keep his memory alive? And one of the siblings raised their hand and says, well, you know, John loved to eat uh, oatmeal for breakfast. So maybe every morning we can eat oatmeal together, and we'll talk about John, and we'll remember John. So they said, oh, that sounds like a great idea. So they have oatmeal for breakfast every morning, and they try to keep uh, John's uh, legacy alive. Well, as you can imagine, you know, every morning having oatmeal, it kind of starts to get old after a while. So after a while, the mother of the family says, we're doing this too often, and it's becoming too routine. Maybe let's do it, just do it once a month. So they did it once a month, and even that got a little routine. So finally, the mother said, well, maybe just, you know, let's, let's do it once a year and do it big, okay? So the mother family says that, and then she says, you know, and when we do it, let's do it special. So she got little uh, silver bowls for the oatmeal, a little silver spoon to eat the oatmeal out, and they found, uh, you know, John's diary, and they had have some readings from John's diary and eat oatmeal out of a little silver bowl and do this ceremony once a year, you know? And at the end of the story, uh, jo uh, the, the narrator, who is presumably one of John's uh, younger siblings, says, you know, I'm about to go off to college and everybody's leaving the house. And, uh, and it, it's gotten to the point where we're just, you know, eating this breakfast once a year. And boy, I wish we could just go back to eating breakfast oatmeal and remembering John. <laughs> okay. So you know what he's saying. You guys know what he's saying, don't you? This is, this is Bailey's understanding of how Eucharistic practice developed in the church, right? 
And the mother of the family is Holy Mother Church. He's the Catholic Church, right? And mom is like, you know, restraining access and adding smells and bells and, and restricting access to this and so on so that it gets ritualized to the point that everybody forgets what the original meaning was. And the original meaning was just to have a meal and to think about Jesus. <laughs> okay. Really? Is that all it was? Okay. Well, okay. Bailey's not a theologian. He's not a Bible scholar, not a church historian. But his little parable, it strongly shaped my understanding of Eucharistic theology for uh, the next 20 or more years of my life, until I was about 30 years old and on the cusp of joining the Catholic Church. And I had about as low a view of the Eucharist as you could possibly have, okay? I had a, like a, a Zwinglian view is technically what they call it. It's just a, it's just a symbolic ceremony. That's it, Okay. And uh, my, my view was lower than that of Calvin himself, who has a little bit of mysticism in it. Uh, but most Calvinists are de facto Zwinglians. It's just like, it's just a symbolic thing, you know. It's an outward profession of your faith. No, nothing miraculous is taking place. Nothing's really happening to you. Nothing's changing its nature. You know, you just chop up the wonder bed into little squares, and you put it on a plate, and you got these little cups of grape juice, and you pass them through the aisle, and everybody eats together and thinks about Jesus, right? Okay. So, just a meal to remember John. And that's the, the, uh, the whole point of Bailey's parable, and that kind of expresses how, uh, to this day, many evangelical Protestants continue, continue to have that view. That's a dominant view of the Eucharist in the U.S., among baptized Christians in the U.S. That's kind of a dominant view. It's just this, this snack to think about Jesus, okay? And many of our parishioners as well, the people that we're spiritually responsible for, are de facto thinking this, okay? And, uh, and, and think that the church has just gotten kind of superstitious about it. And so we have to, but we have to ask a question. And sometimes we might have a, a sneaking you know, suspicion. Maybe we have a nagging voice in the back of our mind that says, well, I profess this with my lips, but could it be that really the church has gotten off track? and put, into, put too much emphasis on this ritual, et cetera. And so we go, got to go back to the sources, and we got to remind ourselves what the Scriptures really say, especially in light of the Jewish context of the writing of the New Testament. Okay, so just a couple of points here. For modern Americans, many details of the Last Supper go unnoticed and unremarked, and it ends up just reading like a meal to remember Jesus. But for Jews of the first century, every detail of the Last Supper accounts would have been significant. And by paying attention to these details, in light of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are the only contemporary Jewish documents we have, by which I mean we actually have the documents that were written pen on paper at that time, okay, enable us to reconstruct the last days of Jesus more vividly. And so what about the Dead Sea Scrolls? The Dead Sea Scrolls are the remains of a monastic library, a Jewish monastery that was sponsored by a sect of the Jews, similar in size to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. This sect was called the Essenes. And uh, they considered themselves to be the true Israelites, the faithful remnant of God's people. They did not call themselves Essenes. They called themselves Israelites. And uh, that's why you don't see them mentioned in the gospel as Essenes. But John chapter 1, remember Nathaniel comes to Jesus. Remember what Jesus says? Here is a true Israelite. Okay, That's characteristic Essene jargon. Okay, Nathaniel very, very well might have been an Essene. In fact, I, I'm, I, personally I'm convinced he was. But anyway, um, the, uh, the Essenes practiced strict observance of God's laws. They lived lives of poverty, prayer, and works of charity. We would have admired them. I, our Lord admired them. When our Lord speaks of those who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, he's primarily talking about the Essenes who practiced celibacy, uh, like these monks uh, along the shores of the Dead Sea. But they didn't just live in monasteries. Um, they also lived in, Josephus tells us, 
in every city of Judea, um, and wherever the Jews lived, you had an Essene community. There was always an Essene quarter or an Essene neighborhood in every major uh, Jewish um, you know, population center. And so they were all over. And uh, they ran you know, what we would think of as like halfway houses or, or charitable houses for unwed mothers and orphans and things like this and did a lot of works of charity. As I said, they alone of all the groups of Jews practiced monasticism. Um, modern Jews, uh, modern rabbinic Jude Judaism, they really bristle about celibacy. They've really got a chip on their shoulder about celibacy, and they say some really unkind uh, things uh, about um, the Catholic practice of celibacy, but that was not always the case. Modern rabbinic Judaism comes from the Pharisees, okay? That's, it's the natural descendants, the genealogical and intellectual descendants of the Pharisaic movement, and they're quite open about that. But the other groups of Jews, the Sadducees and the Essenes, they were wiped out uh, in the Jewish war that ended in the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. Only the Pharisees survived, and they became modern Judaism. And so our understanding of Judaism is distorted by the Pharisee movement, but the Pharisee movement was only one expression of ancient Judaism. And we have to recover, uh, you know, a sense of other forms of ancient Judaism, like Essenism. And so the Essenes had a monastery by the shores of the Dead Sea, and the remains of their library are the famous uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay? So geographically, we're talking about the north end of the Dead Sea. Many of you have been there on pilgrimage, and you know what I'm talking about, directly east of Jerusalem, but down several thousand feet to the lowest place on the face of the planet. This is a relief map showing a little bit of the terrain in the area. You can see that Jerusalem's up on the ridge line. That's the, that's the watershed between uh, western Israel and eastern Israel. Rain that falls on the east of Jerusalem goes down to the Mediterranean. Rain that falls, uh, I'm sorry, to the west of Jerusalem uh, goes down to the Mediterranean. Rain that falls to the east goes down to the Dead Sea and eventually evaporates. Uh, so straight east from Jerusalem on the shore of the sea, you have this location that we call Qumran. And these are two of the Arab uh, cousins. There were three Arab cousins who originally discovered the scrolls. One of them tossed a rock into a cave mouth. They heard the shattering of pottery and came back days later to investigate and um, pulled out the first three of uh, what eventually be, uh, became uh, over a thousand scrolls that were discovered in these different caves. So this is an image of the limestone bluffs that ring the shore of the Dead Sea. And down below these bluffs, you had a, a plateau. You still have a plateau. And on the flat surface of that plateau, you can see all the foundations of an ancient dwelling. That was the monastery. One of the interesting features about this um, ancient dwelling was the large number of ritual baths. Uh, Jews call these mikvaot in the plural. Uh, plur uh, a singular is a mikveh. And there were at least 10 mikvaot uh, in, in an area just a couple acres uh, large. That's the largest concentration of Jewish ritual baths in any one spot from this time period. So whoever lived here was very serious about staying ritually clean. You can see how large these were and how they had multiple staircases going down in. One staircase was when you were clean and going down into the water, and another was when you were, I'm sorry, when you're unclean and coming down into the water, and a different staircase when you are cleansed and heading back up out of the pool, because, of course, you don't want to bump into your dirty brother who's coming down the staircase when you're coming up cleansed. And, oh, oh, you touched me. Now I got to go back and wash again, you know. So separate staircases for traffic flow. And uh, there were enough of these that 100 to 200 men could wash in a relatively short period of time, immerse themselves, um, and, uh, and get out again in a relatively quick time manner. Let's talk about some of the scrolls that were found there. Uh, the, the nicest uh, find, the most beautiful find, is the Great Isaiah Scroll. This is one of the first scrolls discovered. It was a complete, was and is, a complete copy of the book of Isaiah dating back 
uh, by carbon dating to about 250 BC. A little younger, if you go by the paleography, you know, the science of handwriting, so a little bit of a debate, but no, no doubt it's very old. It's our oldest complete book uh, of the Bible, really. And um, in the original language, in Hebrew, and uh, when it was discovered, it was just in a pristine condition. Um, you know, a lot of these scrolls uh, were, were found uh, in jars buried under s- up to six feet of bat guano in the bottom of these caves. And they had to dig out all that bat stuff, okay, to get at these. But, you know, that was providential because all that bat dung uh, kept these things in an oxygen-free environment for thousands of years. And in the absence of oxygen, things just don't age. You know? So when they dug them out and pulled them out, you know, the, like the great Isaiah scroll, this is a color photograph taken in 1948. You can see how beautiful the color of the leather is and how clear the writing is. It's just amazing. You know? And I think that's the first big theological takeaway that we can have from the scrolls, okay? If you feel like life is burying you under a heap of stuff, okay, (laughs) it might just be because God has a providential purpose for your life, okay? (laughs) So as as a profound theological datum from from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and this this scroll is in less uh, good condition, kind of fragmentary condition, these are some fragments of what we call the community rule. Uh, it was uh, uh, kind of like equivalent to the rule of St. Benedict or the rule of St. Francis. It was the religious rule that regulated their common life. So it's the oldest example of the genre of a religious rule in Western civilization. How ironic. Who knew that uh, the oldest form of monasticism in Western civilization was actually Jewish, Uh, but it was, and uh, this was their uh, rule, and we found 12 copies of it. They were all kind of partially broken and and somewhat fragmentary, but between the 12 different copies that we discovered, we're able to piece together the entire text of the document, and in my opinion and the opinion of many scholars, it's actually the community rule that's the, the most theologically important document in the entire collection because it gives a very good synopsis of their religious worldview, their sacramental practice, their common life, and their eschatology. So get a really good view of, of how they thought and worshipped from the community rule. And it's this document that has, for example, the most phrases in common with Uh, the Johannine literature and the Pauline literature of the New Testament. There's several phrases in the community rule that are only elsewhere found in, for example, the Gospel of John or the Epistles of John, and sometimes a few of St. Paul's epistles as well. So what do the Essenes have to do with the Last Supper? Well, these Essene monks hid their library when they saw that they were going to be wiped out by the Roman soldiers in the year 70, and we discovered it uh, in 1947. And But what does this have to do with the Eucharist? Well, this is interesting. Did, did these Essenes have anything like the Eucharist? Well, the Jewish historian Josephus describes their religious practice, and he says they labor till the fifth hour. That's 11 a.m. by our clocks, so just an hour before noon. And afterwards, they assemble... And when they have clothed themselves in white veils, they then bathe in cold water. This is all those mikvah oat that we saw, all those big, you know, we would call them baptismal pools uh, at their monastery. Um, After this purification, they meet together in a private room into which no other sect may enter. So only those who are initiated may go into this room, this dining room. While they go after a pure matter into the dining room as into a holy temple, okay? So they do this with religious reverence. This is not just some snack. They're not going to get refreshments. Uh, They're going into this room, and this is a sacred meal. This is a sacred occasion, and they treat it with the dignity of entering the temple in Jerusalem. And they quietly set themselves down 
uh, upon which the baker lays them loaves in order. And here Josephus uses some phrases when he describes the baker of the community laying down the loaves. He uses some Greek words that are used in the Old Testament for laying the loaves of the bread of the presence uh, on the uh, golden table in the tabernacle. Okay, so Josephus is intentionally evoking the, uh, you know, the, the sacred bread of, um, of the tabernacle, the bread of the presence. And he goes, Josephus goes on, and he says, but a priest says grace before the meal, in other words, praise, and it is unlawful for anyone to taste of the food before grace be said. Okay? So no eating before the, the uh, blessing of the food. The same priest, when he has dined, says grace again after the meal, and when they begin and when they end, they praise God, which means they sing or chant uh, uh, psalms of praise. And, and we're going to look at this in a minute because we, we have found their hymn book. Okay? Their hymn book is preserved. After which they lay aside their white garments and they labor again till evening. Okay? So like monks at other times, you know, it's ora et labora, right? So they labor until noon. Then they have this sacred washing. They have this sacred meal. They pray. They chant hymns. And then they go back to their labor until sundown, and they, then they come back for evening prayer, as it were, right? Okay, so that was Josephus, who is uh, part of the Pharisee movement, and he's writing as an outsider, and he's describing uh, what he knows. And he spent some time, he, he was like an aspirant uh, to the Essenes for a while, and so he lived with them and, and knew them a little bit, but, um, but again, an outsider's perspective. Now... Let's look at an insider's perspective. Let's read some of the scrolls themselves. This is the community rule. Remember how I told you, describe their sacramental practice. And it says, they shall eat, pray, and deliberate communally. Wherever 10 men belonging to the party of the community are gathered, a priest must always be present. That's a, this is a quorum, okay? It's a quorum of 10, and, and you need a priest. And the men shall sit before the priest by rank, when the table has been set for eating or the new wine and the new wine ready for drinking, it is the priest who shall stretch out his hand first, bless the first portion of the bread or the new wine. Okay, so this is how they have their sacramental meal, and they can, they can celebrate the meal as long as they have a quorum of 10 and a priest, but the priest must celebrate. He must officiate. And uh, they also had excommunication. So these are the rules by which a ca cases are to be decided at a community inquiry. If there be found among them a man who has lied about money and done so knowingly, they shall bar him from the pure meals of the many for one year. Look at that phrase. This is what they called their proto-Eucharist. They called it the pure food or the pure meal of the many. And the many or the multitude, rabim in Hebrew, that was one of the names that they had for their movement. They referred to themselves as the multitude, the multitude of Israel, for example. Okay, so look at that language. That's such interesting language. And uh, lied about money knowingly and getting barred from the, the community. Ring any bells, anybody? Acts, right? This is the first offense against the church that we read about in Acts is Ananias and Sapphira. It's the first offense listed in the Dead Sea Scrolls that you can commit against the community is lying about money knowingly. And it's the first reported violation of the communal life of the church in the book of Acts. I don't know exactly what the, but I don't think that can be a coincidence, okay? Something's going on there, uh, but it's just so striking. That, uh, yeah, again, first sin against the community is, is knowingly lying about money. Now, interestingly, okay, there is an appendix to the community rule in one of its copies that has a kind of adjustments for their communal life for when the Messiah arrives because they believed that the Messiah was coming anytime and they wanted to be ready and they wanted to know how to celebrate this sacred meal with the Messiah when he showed up. And so they describe how to perform the rite when, when, you have, when the Messiah arrives. And it, and it says, 
Then the Messiah of Israel may enter. The Messiah of Israel is the royal Messiah. They, they, uh, in some of their documents, they reflect the view that there's going to be a priest of Messiah and a royal Messiah. But anyway, the Messiah of Israel may enter, and the heads of the thousands of Israel are to sit before him by rank. Notice that. Everybody has to sit by rank. When they gather at the communal table, none may reach for the first portion of the bread or wine before the priest. The priest here is the priestly Messiah. Okay? So interesting, look how the royal Messiah is subject to the priestly Messiah, at least when it comes to the liturgy. And the priestly Messiah has to bless. For he shall bless the first portion of the bread and the wine, reaching for the bread first. Notice how emphatic they are about that. Afterward, the Messiah of Israel shall reach for the bread. Then the royal Messiah Finally, each member of the whole congregation by rank. Okay, that's how you do it when the Messiahs come. All right, so Josephus says, when they begin and when they end, they praise God as he that bestows their food upon them. Now, I told you we found uh, their hymn book, uh, and scholars call it um, uh, 1Q Chodayot. Okay, it comes from the first Qumran cave. Chodayot means praises or thanksgivings in uh, Hebrew. So it's the book of thanksgivings. It's a book of hymns, and all of their hymns, or really what they are is psalms. They're, they're uh, new psalms that the leader of the community wrote, probably written by this mysterious refounder of their community called the uh, Teacher of Righteousness. But all of these hymns or psalms begin in the same stylized way. They all begin with the phrase, I give thanks to you, O Lord. Okay, all of them. So uh, one of them begins, I give thanks to you, O Lord, for you have redeemed my soul from the pit. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> all right, well, so. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we'll see what happens here. Okay. Give you thanks to the Lord for you have redeemed. Thank you. Uh, you have redeemed my soul from the pit, from Sheol and Abaddon. Another begins, I give thanks to you, Lord, for you have become a wall of strength for me. Another one, I give thanks to you, Lord, for you have made my face shine by your covenant. So this is how they all began, right? They're written in Hebrew. But, you know, if you translate that into Greek, you know how that comes out? Eucharisto Kyrie. That's how I, I thank you, O Lord. Eucharisto Kyrie. That's how that comes out. <laughs> and Josephus says, they chanted one of those at the beginning and one at the end, okay? So beginning and ending by giving thanks to God. So look at this. Did they have a Eucharist? Well, they had a communal meal that anticipated the meal with the Messiah in the final age. A priest officiated at that meal. The meal was bread and wine. One had to be a member of their new covenant community to take the meal. I didn't even talk about that, but they call themselves the community of the new covenant. New Covenant, Barith Chadash, okay? It's the same phrase that the Chaldeans used when the Chaldean rite uses to this day when the Chaldeans celebrate the Eucharistic uh, liturgy, Barith Chadash. I, I heard it when I was in um, Escondido at John Paul the Great University, which has a large Chaldean uh, contingent in the student body and among the faculty. I went to a Chaldean mass or Chaldean liturgy when I was down there some years ago just got chills up and down my spine because they celebrate in Aramaic, which is a spoken language of Jesus, which is sometimes indistinguishable from Hebrew. And so Jeremiah promises the Barith Harash, the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, 31, and the Chaldeans lift up the host to say, this is the Barith Harash. Woo! <laughs> Amen? It's like, Whoa! You know, no going through Greek, no going through Latin, no going through English, just all in the same language. And bam, it's got so much more impact when you don't have to do all the mental jumping between the different languages that we do. Holy cow. This is the new covenant. So, yeah, they call themselves the, the community of the new covenant. And uh, the sign that you were fully initiated into the new covenant was that you were able to partake of both the bread and the wine. Okay. After a one-year probation, you were, added, uh, you were admitted to the bread, and after a further year's probation, you were added to the wine. So actually, it was a three-year process. It was like, a, like an aspirancy, a postulancy, and a novitiate. 
you know, after your aspirancy, you could wash, and then another year as a postulant, and then you could take the bread, and then another year as a novice, and then you could take the wine, and then you were fully part of the, <coughs> the Berith Hadash, the, the Yachad Berith Hadash, <coughs> the community of the New Covenant. And sinning against the community meant loss of access to this meal. And a meal began and ended with the Thanksgiving Psalms, starting with or beginning with, I thank you, O Lord. Okay, well, all right. So this is a photograph that we recovered from among the Dead Sea Scrolls. It had to be colorized. Anyway, it's, uh, yeah, reenactors, you know, kind of imagining how this might have looked. They wore white garments of linen uh, because they considered themselves a priestly movement. Okay, and so, like, where are they getting this, th these ideas? Well, we looked at those texts on Tuesday. You know, the, the meal of, um, of fine wine from Isaiah uh, 23 and uh, the free meal for the poor of the earth in Isaiah 55, 1 through 3, and others as well. And so they're meditating on those texts, and they're trying to, you know, get ready for the coming of the Messiah. And they, 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 they anticipate that there's going to be this eschatological banquet. And so they start celebrating it already to kind of be prepared. And now in light of that, in light of the Old Testament text that we looked at on Tuesday, and now this Jewish practice that we looked at today, <coughs> let's go back to especially Luke, who gives us the longest account of the institution of the Eucharist. And there we read in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Okay. Well, American Christians just read that, like, all right, well, he's taking bread, and he gives it to them. But notice, who takes the bread first, and who blesses it? Jesus. And what kind of action is that in this kind of religious culture? That's what the priest, only the priest can do, okay? How many times didn't we see that? Only the priest was, reach his hand out first, okay? So, so this is, this is, you know, some of the, the connotation or the, the social religious significance of what Jesus is doing is just lost because we're modern Americans. But this is a priestly act. The point I'm making, fathers and brothers, is that modern Christians miss the cultic, priestly, and liturgical significance of what's taking place in the upper room, and they just read it flat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We'll come back to that phrase. This is the line that gives so many people the wrong idea that this is just a meal to remember Jesus by. Broke my heart uh, about six years ago. I was giving a, a parish mission in Texas. And after I got done with a talk, uh, an older gentleman came up to me and he said, you know, my son has left the church and now he's a Baptist pastor. And, and could you talk to him about, you know, the Eucharist and, and the church? I'm like, sure, I've be fine to talk to me. He said, well, he's here tonight, so I'll go get him. So he <laughs> right, goes, it brings back his son, you know, who's 30-something and, you know, fine, fine young man and, you know, very respectful. And so we have this dialogue. And so we agree to, to email back and forth. And so he sends me stuff and I send him stuff. And I, I try to talk to him about the Eucharist, which is what I found persuasive. You know, when I found Ignatius of Antioch, 10 years after St. John the apostle's death, saying, stay away from anybody who claims to be a Christian but refuses to confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of Jesus Christ, which suffered and which was raised. You know, so powerful for me. So I'm sharing this stuff with him, and all he comes back with is, well, all I, you know, it's just this meal to remember Jesus. It's just this meal to remember Jesus. Like, but you don't, ah! Well, we'll come back to that phrase. All right. Likewise, the cup after supper, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Holy cow. What did you say? All right. Well, first of all, this is the long-awaited meal with the Messiah. Okay, so, you know, so I figure about four of the apostles had a background in Essenism, right? Just like other of the apostles had a background in Pharisaism, St. Matthew and St. James the less. I'm convinced that they were Pharisees 
uh, before they followed Jesus. Uh, I would say John and Andrew and Nathaniel and maybe one other uh, were previously from the Essene movement, and there may have been a former Sadducee among the apostles. And, you know, we know that Simon used to be a zealot, right? So they're, they come from different religious political parties, but especially for the for the apostles that came out of Essenism, when they see Jesus doing this, they're getting chills up and down their spine because they recognize this is what they expected the priestly Messiah to do at the end of time. So Jesus giving thanks and blessing the bread and the wine at this sacred meal, this is a priestly act. He's acting like the priestly Messiah of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And now let's look at that line, do this in remembrance of me. That is literally, that can literally be translated, do this as my memorial offering. Because this, uh, this word that's used for remembrance is anamnesis. You may have heard that before. Remember that from seminary or from reading Dr. Hahn's books or something like that. But uh, this word for memorial or remembrance is anamnesin. And the Greek here is literally do this, ice tain emain anamnesin. Do this as or unto my memorial. And that word memorial was often used as shorthand for the memorial offering. So you see that the heading of Psalms uh, 38 and 70, which in the Septuagint are Psalms 37 and 69, they both have a heading that says for the memorial offering. And that comes out in Greek as ice anamnason, for the memorial. Okay, so again, this is do this as my memorial offering. What was the memorial offering? The memorial offering was an offering of grain or flour in the temple on, on regular occasions, which was meant to remind God of the covenant. Now, does it literally mean remind him as if like God, oh, I forgot the covenant. Damn, you're right. Okay, yeah. I was like, who are my people? Who are my? Oh, yeah, you're my people. Okay. No, God doesn't literally need reminding, but this was, they were searching for what we would call renew. Okay. They didn't have a word for renew. They use this idea of remind, which is like, you know, call, call up or recollect. Okay. So, uh, so again, the memorial offering was a grain offering offered periodically in the temple to renew the covenant. Does it make any sense at all to think of the Eucharist as a grain offering that renews the covenant? <laughs> Works for me. Okay. It's not, is that all I'd want to say? No. Okay, that's only like, that's 1% of what I would want to say about the Eucharist. But it's, it's at least that, amen? Okay, so much more, body, blood, soul, and divinity, all that. Okay, but it's certainly at least that. Okay, so do this as my memorial offering. And likewise, the cup after the supper saying, this cup which is poured out is the new covenant in my blood. That is huge. Let's look at that again. Let's look at verse 20, okay? Likewise, the cup after supper saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant. Wow. They had been waiting 600 years for the new covenant, Okay. About 600 years pri previously, around the year 587, Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, said, The days are coming, says the Lord God, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with them when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, and I had to show myself to be their master. But this is the covenant that, that I will make with him in those days. I will write my law upon their hearts. And then he goes on to describe the, what we know as the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That is the only place in the entire Old, Old Testament where the phrase new covenant is used. And here Jesus uses that key phrase, drawing a direct line back to Jeremiah 31, 31, and saying, this reality that you've been waiting for for 600 years, I'm doing it now. And I'm sure James, you know, leaned over to Andrew and said, did he just say what I thought he said? So like, this is going down now, right here, you know? 
And again, chills up and down the spine because the new covenant is going to replace the one when God took Israel by the hand and led them out of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, and he had to show himself to be their master. Do you remember what that covenant was? We call that the, well, yes, that's connected, yeah, Mosaic covenant, right? The covenant of Moses or the Sinai covenant, right? With the 12 tribes at the foot of Mount Sinai. We looked at Exodus 24 on Tuesday. So the new covenant is going to replace that. So what Jesus is saying is what I'm doing with you 12 here in the upper room on Mount Zion is as significant as what Moses did with the 12 tribes at the foot of Sinai. Dang. You know what happened at Sinai. Earthquake, fire, wind, lightning, storm, shaking the ground, the trumpet voice of God that struck fear into the hearts of the people, okay? But what I'm doing with you in the upper room is as epic as what took place at the foot of Sinai in Exodus 24. This is huge, okay? So this is um, the new covenant uh, in, uh, in his blood. Now let's talk about that phrase, in my blood. That means consisting of my blood. Okay? So, um, so let's look at this again. This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant. That's epic. In my blood, which means consisting of my blood, because that's what the cup is referring to, right? You know, that, you know, people say, here, drink this cup, but you think about it, you never drink a cup. It would stick in your throat, right? You can't swallow a cup, right? You only, when we talk about that, it's an expression for the contents of the cup, right? Okay? So when he says this cup, he's talking about the contents of the cup, which that's why he, that's why he clarifies in my blood. Now, the blood of Jesus in the cup, is that his physical blood or his sacramental blood? Amen. You guys all went to a great seminary, okay? Uh, sacramental blood, right? Because he didn't open a vein and fill it with his blood, because then it would taste like blood, right? But what he did in this case was he took wine and transformed it into the substance of his blood without losing the accidents. So it tasted like wine, but it was actually his blood. So blood in that form... It's the same as his physical blood, but to specify, since it doesn't have the accidents, we call it the sacramental blood of the Lord. So, so and, and the sacramental blood of our Lord, that is one of the species of the Eucharist, right? So let's, let's simplify this even further. So the new covenant is the Eucharist, absolutely. The new covenant is the Eucharistic blood of Christ, and we know the properties inter intercommunicate, so it's not like, oh, it's the blood, but not the body, you know, so something crazy like that. No, the, uh, the new covenant is the Eucharistic body and blood of our Lord. Well, that is crazy, you know, because the whole Bible is a sequence of covenants, and it's not just Catholics that think of it, think of it that way. I mean, I grew up as a Calvinist, and uh, we were all into covenant. We knew that the Bible was a sequence of covenants. Uh, my, my home church was called Covenant Christian Reformed Church in the south end of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay? And, and later, I would write a book about the covenants, this one here. And actually, the first like five or six chapters of this, I could have written as a Calvinist. Because it's like, yeah, this is all, we all knew, we knew about you know, Adamic covenant, Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant, Davidic. We all knew that yeah, this is a sequence, right? Up to the new covenant. But we didn't pay attention to this verse. What actually is the new covenant? It's the Eucharist. What did we think the new covenant was? Well, you know, Christ's sacrifice on the cross. So, and that's not wrong, but you're losing this. That's too vague, Okay more specific, okay? It's the Eucharistic body and blood of our Lord. Now, and then further, further uh, confusion is introduced because then we go into, we go into Latin, right? And in Latin, new covenant is novum testamentum, right? And that gives us a phrase in English, right? New Testament, yeah? But then you go on the streets of Steubenville or you go on 
the streets of, you know, um, Houston or down in the Bible Belt or wherever, and you ask people, what is the New Testament? And if they know it all, what are they going to tell you? It's the Bible. It's the second half of the Bible. It's, you know, it's the books Matthew through Revelation. If they're really zealous, you know, then they've got one on them, okay, and they pull one out. Now, th this is a Catholic New Testament. This is a confraternity pocket edition from Scepter Publishers. You know how I learned to carry one of these? From a Catholic. <laughs> a Bible-toting Catholic at the University of Notre Dame converted me and eventually became my sponsor into the Catholic Church. That's a whole other story. But I learned to carry a pocket New Testament from a Catholic. I got a bunch out there. If you don't have one, I urge you to get one and carry it with you so that you're always armed, you know? And uh, so, you know, uh, around here in Ohio, you, you see this motion? You know, you, know, you know what we call this in Ohio? Concealed carry. Okay. It's, it's legal in Ohio. And then uh, you're in ever, ever in a situation of spiritual warfare, you can draw, you know? And uh, so pick one of those up, uh, gentlemen, and, and, and carry those with you. It's a good witness and a good example for your people. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, um, but, uh, okay, so back to this. So, you know, so maybe somebody's got that, oh, this is the new covenant, or this is the new testament. What's the new testament? This is a new testament. Is this the new testament? No. This is the 27 books about the new testament. Okay. But the New Testament, the New Covenant, is the Eucharist, okay? And uh, so some of you have heard me say this before, but I'm going to say it again. You know, if you're calling yourself a Christian, if you're calling yourself a New Testament Christian, but all your religious practice only consists of reading and meditating on the Bible, which is what it's like for many evangelical Protestants, but you're calling yourself a New Testament Christian, all you're doing is reading your Bible, then you are like the person who goes to the Chinese restaurant, reads the whole menu, and never orders General Tso's chicken. I mean, what's the point? Okay? And, and don't get me wrong, all right? It's not that I've got anything against the menu. Okay? I've got a doctorate in menu studies. Okay? <laughs> from the University of Notre Dame. I love the menu. I love the languages of the menu. I love the literary structure of the menu, you know? But it's a menu pointing to a meal, and much more than a meal, because it's a meal where you personally encounter the host, who is also the food, who gives himself to you. But that's what I mean when I started off my talk on Tuesday saying the whole Bible points to the Eucharist, okay? It's a sequence, it's a story of a sequence of covenants. Covenants are family relationships formed by an oath, one after another through the Old Testament, all leading up to the ministry of Christ. And Christ brings the new one, the new and eternal one that's never going to be taken away. And it's the Eucharist. It's his presence in the sacrament. Amen? Amen. And so we got to get people to realize that this is the menu. You want to read it, but then you want to do what it points to, and you go want to go partake of the meal. And, you know, when I was, I used to do evangelism, I used to do door-to-door -door evangelism as, as a Protestant pastor. And you know what our closing verse always was before we led people in the sinner's prayer? Closing verse that we would quote to people? Nope. Revelation 3.20, absolutely. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will go in and eat with him and he with me. And then we'd say, do you hear Jesus knocking on the door of your heart? And if they said yes, then we say, would you like to pray to let him in? Say yes, then we lead him in the sinner's prayer. And you know the irony of that? What's actually being talked about? <laughs> right? It's, it's Eucharistic imagery. It, what that meal that Jesus is going to share with you, that's the Eucharist. That's what John's talking about through, through the Mysterium Arcana, you know, the, the, the disguised way of talking about the sacraments that was practiced in the early church. And so, so we non-Eucharistic Christians were using a Eucharistic verse to close the deal on, on the gospel when we would present it. Okay, so this is, this is earth-shaking. Okay, so this, this, 
The blood of Jesus in this cup is the new covenant that we've been waiting as Jews for 600 years for. And this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. You know, pro multis, right? And like, you know, I've had priests tell me, oh, it shouldn't say for many. It should say for all. I'm like, well, first of all, it's in Scripture, so we're not like free to just like revise what Scripture says. You know, secondly, you got to understand the Jewish context for that term. The term many was used for the religious community that was gathered together in prayer to await for the Messiah. Look at, look at how it's used in the Dead Sea Scrolls. If the novice does proceed in joining the party of the Yachad, that means community in Hebrew, he must not touch the pure food of the many. That's their proto-Eucharist before they have examined him as to his spiritual fitness and works and not before a full year has passed. Okay, so you have to go through the postulancy before you are admitted to the pure food of the many. The many is the term for the community. So look at that. Matthew 26, 28, poured out for many. This is authentic uh, Jewish religious jargon from the first century. This is not a later language made up by the second, third generation of the Christian church and retrojected into the mouth of the historical Jesus which probably a lot of you were taught in seminary, and I was taught that too. Probably, all, yeah. How many of you heard stuff like that? You know, this is second, gen, third generation, whatever Christian stuff written back into the New Testament. No, okay. The Dead Sea Scrolls show this kind of language just rings authentically with how devout Jews spoke in the first century. And um, let's go on. And likewise, the cup after the supper, cup saying, okay, uh, we looked at that. Okay, I got the wrong. Uh, PowerPoint up here. <laughs> All right. This is not the one that I fixed up for you guys. All right. Um, then he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. That language of poured out for you is from the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. He poured out his soul to death and the soul is in the blood. Leviticus 17, 14 says, the soul of every creature is its blood. Okay, using nephesh, the Hebrew word for soul. Same word used in 53, Isaiah 53, 12. And so my blood poured out for you, that is my soul or my life poured out for you. Jesus is the suffering servant who's both priest and victim. And a dispute arose amongst them who was to be regarded as the greatest. Why are they having an argument about who's greatest in the context of the Last Supper? It's because... At these sacred meals, you had to sit by rank. That's right. And so it makes sense. That's why, in particular, this argument comes up in that context. And then Jesus says to them after, the, <coughs> after he settles that argument, <coughs> you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I covenant to you as my Father covenanted to me a kingdom. You've probably never seen it translated like this before. So I checked all, all the com contemporary English translations earlier today, looking at the NABRE and the RSV CE2 and um, the NIV and so on. They say a point or a sign or confer, but nobody translates it literally. This is actually the Greek word for covenant making. And everywhere else in the New Testament that this term is used, it's, uh, it's talking about making a covenant. But in this one, in one instance, all the English versions say, just a point or confer or whatever. And, and if you get into it, you find out that they don't think that covenant making makes sense in context. <laughs> like, why would that make sense in the context in which he's just made the new covenants, right? <laughs> no, that was, that was ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense at all, right? I covenant to you, but, but what gets them is he covenants a kingdom, and you're supposed to covenant a covenant. You're supposed to diatitheme a diatheke. And that makes to, to covenant to covenant in, in Greek. And here he's covenanting a kingdom. And they're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Except when we think about it, there is one kingdom in the Old Testament that was established by a covenant. And that was the kingdom of David, right? 2 Samuel 5 and 2 Samuel 7, two covenants actually, a covenant between David and the people and a covenant between David and God. It was this dual covenant that established the Davidic kingdom. And Jesus is the son of Moses? No. Actually, he's uh, come to me. Son of, oh, David. 
dead. Yes. Yes, indeed. So if Jesus is the king and he's the son of David, then Jesus' kingdom is the kingdom of David. That's right. Which, oh, coincidentally, established by a covenant. So I covenant to you as my father covenanted to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So we have echoes here of uh, David the king and the kingdom of, by covenant, and the apostles are being given a princely status, which is seen in our bishops. That's why our bishops wear mitres, but that's shared with you. You are collaborators of your bishop, kind of extension to your, his officials on his behalf. You resent, re represent his, his princely rule over the local tribe of Israel. Here it's the tribe of Steubenville. <coughs> you know, but there's the tribe of Fort Wayne, South Bend. There's the tribe of L.A., you know, the tribe of Galveston, Houston. And each of them has a prince with his uh, royal officials gathered around him, uh, extending his kingdom. So summing up here, <coughs> <coughs> the Last Supper is no mere memorial meal, as many Christians mistakenly think. The disciples would have understood the priestly and messianic significance of Jesus' actions because they had the concept of a bread and wine meal with the Messiah in the end times. And the Eucharist is a covenant meal, making us God's family and establishing us as God's kingdom. And the Eucharist also, of course, goes beyond anything that the Essenes imagined. But let's go back to Bailey's story, and let's look at his story about that oatmeal breakfast to remember the beloved oldest son, John, versus what the Eucharist actually is. Okay, is the Eucharist nothing but a meal to remember John? Well, first of all, let's think about it. John's family wasn't building on a long tradition of sacred meals in their culture, were they? No, but Jesus was, okay? Furthermore, John's parents weren't claiming to establish a new covenant between God, the creator, and all the human race through this meal. But Jesus was, amen? I mean, isn't that just a little bit of difference? Okay. The creator God and the human race, and this is the family bond between us, okay? And uh, none of the meal actions of John's family were intended or understood to be priestly or liturgical, okay? But Jesus's were, as we saw, Jesus's family, I'd say John's family wasn't culturally formed to expect to celebrate a breakfast of oatmeal with the Messiah in the end of time, right? But the apostles were formed to expect bread and wine with the Messiah at the end of time. And uh, almost as important about the new covenant, John's parents didn't claim to be fulfilling ancient prophecies, 600-year-old prophecies by, you know, the great prophets of Israel by celebrating this meal. But Jesus was. Let's go to him in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of the Eucharist and the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you also for the providential discovery of the scrolls, which kind of highlight and, and you know, bring to greater color and greater clarity this Old Testament and Jewish background so we can understand the full significance of of what our Lord was doing. Heavenly Father, please help us as we try to explain to our people and to anyone who will listen the, the true meaning of what our Lord was doing uh, in the upper room and how that is perpetuated in the Catholic Church until the end of time so that so many may come and feed on Jesus in the most blessed sacrament and come to know him not only by reading about him in the book, but by consuming him in the meal where he is priest and sacrifice. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.